there's a technology on your phone that makes it very difficult to hack. In fact, it is going to be much more immune to an attack compared to your desktop computer. This is why when someone comes to me and says their phone has been hacked, I start off by being dubious since you have to be an important person to be targeted on a phone. You'll be fighting against a state typically. Can a regular hacker attack your phone? Yes, but usually it will be because of something you did yourself, but this is preventable. Now, the reason it is difficult to hack a phone is because of its unique technology. The way applications run are much more controlled than on a desktop OS. There are security layers built in that are not part of a desktop OS, like Windows or even Linux. Stay right there to understand how your phone is secured and how your bad decisions can allow it to be hacked. Just for comparison, I'll start my explanation by describing how a programmer would create software for a Windows operating system. Normally, the programmer would use one of the common computer languages like C, for example, and this creates what is known as an executable. And this then can run natively on the machine and do all functions supported by the machine. When I use the word natively, it means the hardware can execute the commands directly. Another term for this is machine language. Nothing in Windows OS can actually stop the program, for example, from accessing the camera, the microphone, the network, and so on. If there is a device on the machine, the executable can use it. This has been the traditional way software has been created for computers over the years. Think of it as direct access between software and hardware. What's different in a mobile phone is that on both Android and iOS, apps do not actually run natively on the device. Instead, they run in a virtual environment often called a virtual machine. This means that the applications are supervised by another layer of software and this layer of software can impose additional rules. The mobile apps do not have direct access to peripherals on the machine. Instead, the mobile apps request that the host software provide the service and it is up to the host software to grant access depending on permissions. On Android, this virtual machine host was originally called Dalvik, and the new version of this is now referred to as Android Runtime, or ART. When an Android developer makes an application for an Android device, he would use an Android environment to program it. The only language supported by the Android environment is Java. That Java code is converted into a format, which is really just a bunch of shortcut instructions understood only by the Android runtime. These shortcut instructions are called bytecode. Now there's a way to install programs that can run native code on an Android just like a computer. In fact, the Android runtime itself is written as an executable. But native applications are not installable by users. These programs are flashed to the phone as part of the operating system. The only other way to bring them to the phone is to root the phone, meaning grant a user the super user permissions to modify the operating system itself. This is where the term rooting comes from. You are bypassing security limitations on the device. Typically, this is reserved for the OEM, the phone maker. Rooting allows this change and is obviously dangerous. So if someone roots your phone or you allow your phone to be rooted, then forget about the security measures I will discuss here because this is the basic override. Often, rooting can be enabled by installing some rooting app. Rooting is basically setting a flag that the OS can see and that causes the limitations to be unlocked. Now, not all OEMs allow this rooting flag to be set through some app. But when you can, the effect is that you will be able to insert native apps. Outside of rooting, you can only install mobile apps as APK files and are only intended to run inside 
the virtual machine. So quick advice, do not root your phone or allow anyone else to install a rooting app. But even if your phone is rooted and someone manages to install a native app, there is another security layer. Now, the way the Android system is designed, a security framework was added to the operating system, and this basically sets a rule for what can happen inside Android. Again, something similar is on iOS, so this explanation still applies. The security framework applies even to native applications, so this is like the next level of protection. The security framework on Android is called Security Enhanced Linux, or SE Linux. SE Linux was developed by a three-letter agency and was then shared to the public and it is one of the ways security is embedded into the operating systems today. This system is also referred to as Mandatory Access Controls or MAC. Basically every program that runs on the device has to run within the predefined security policy. The way this works, the security policy has to be embedded into the executable itself. For example, there will be limits on what any program can do to access memory or storage. This security policy is implemented in a more visible way inside the Android runtime by actually breaking out every possible action as a predefined permission. When apps are installed, the Android runtime will pop a message showing the permissions requested by each app when you install them. This puts the burden on you, the user, to make sure that you do not install apps with unintended permission. Permissions change over time. For example, early versions of Android did not specify a permission to use the gyro sensor on the device. Later on, this permission was broken out as several specific permissions, including a fitness layer for fitness devices. It was determined, for example, that the gyro can be used to track location as well as to even capture voice data just from the device vibration. So to fine-tune this control, several permissions were defined and limitations given. For example, some permissions do not work in the background. So the secret use of the gyro is now not allowed. You ought to wonder why a phone dialer app, for example, wants access to a camera or why TikTok requires file access to internal storage, or if an app is requesting contacts access. If you willy-nilly give apps permissions that are not consistent with the application's purpose, then that app can take advantage of you. Some apps, for example, like Log Me In, allow remote control permissions. If you don't think of this, then don't be surprised if someone gains access to your phone remotely since you had to install the app and grant it permission. Fortunately, you can always go back to your apps list and review permissions you've previously granted or remove apps that you don't remember installing. If you rooted your phone though and started installing system files, then likely you will not know exactly what those programs do and you may have no control over what they can access. Now, generally speaking, the SE Linux framework prevents any app from just doing something in secret. It should not be possible to download, let's say, a flashlight app that did not ask for permissions and then have that flashlight app turn on the camera and the microphone. So if you're aware of the apps you installed, there is no easy direct way to install malware on your device. Some have asked me this question. Why is it necessary to have a login on the phone, particularly a Google phone where the phone is only used to make calls? The login is actually tied to another security measure which many people may not be aware of. When you put a PIN code on a phone, that PIN code actually encrypts the data partition of the phone and that PIN code is used to be your login to an encryption code which is stored on the phone only. This means if someone steals your phone without knowing the PIN code, they will not be able to decrypt the data portion of the phone. If someone cannot log into your phone, the only option that will be available to them 
would be to overwrite the operating system with a new flashed operating system. But this will cause the data partition to be wiped out. So in theory, the worst that a hacker could do to your phone would be to wipe the phone's data, but not to capture that data. Let me describe a case to you that I helped a client identify. A next husband was able to read text that the ex-wife did not reveal to anyone. She did not know how it was done and consulted with me on this. After some investigation, I discovered that the young son was given an iPad by the father as a gift, and the iPad was assigned to the Apple ID of the father. Thus, it really was an active spy device since not only could the father access iMessage from the same Apple ID, but could also put remote access software on the iPad before handing the iPad over to the kid. So what was assumed to be some complex hacking maneuver was explained by just simple social engineering. The solution was to reset the iPad to have the mother's Apple ID and thus ensure that no outside party had access to the device. This is an example of someone misunderstanding how information is taken since there was no hack. The purpose in explaining all this is that I want to make it clear that the security in a phone is much more robust than a Windows or even Linux operating system on a computer, neither of which have mandatory access control built into the OS itself. Though SE Linux can be installed on Linux, you will find that you do not have any way of enforcing this at a refined level for every single app as you do on Android Runtime. So generally speaking, the chances of hacking of a mobile phone that is not rooted, where unknown apps are deleted and permissions reviewed, are super small. Having said this, there are some very advanced hacks and are based on what are known as zero days, meaning these are defects in the operating system that have not been publicized and often bought and sold among state players that can afford to pay for them. This is not access available to your neighbor who you think is a hacker. The well-known Pegasus attack is an example of this. Members of the press have been spied on by the Pegasus malware, which comes from the Israeli NSO group. The software was then supplied to states like Saudi Arabia to attack various people. I don't know if it is even clear to Apple yet what the actual zero day is that allows this access, but they are aware that it comes from iMessage attachments that people click on and then that bypasses the security on the iPhone, likely by corrupting memory on the device. Apple instituted the lockdown mode for vulnerable users, which is basically just preventing attachments from being opened. Something you can just choose to do on your own. Another known attack on phones has to do with controlling the baseband modem of the phone. You can send text, turn on the phone microphone, have it call out, read text, and do all this with hidden instructions called hidden text. This is known as the simjacker attack, and the attack goes through the cell network to the baseband modem of the phone. This is the radio receiver for the cell signal. However, this attack does not provide control to Android itself, for example. It just gives control of the baseband modem functions to the calling and texting side. So this does not provide a hack to access your photos, for example, or to take over Android. There are other attacks on the baseband modem, which is the most secretive part of the phone. Someone, for example, was able to access memory and store a file on the disk from it. I had a video on that and it was using a Samsung Exynos. This, however, has not been demonstrated to install an executable. In summary, it is clearly extremely difficult to hack a phone. The common vulnerabilities would often be from someone you know who knows your device password, or if you're hacked into installing an app with permissions you did not check, or if you rooted your phone and started loading software from unsafe sources. In these cases, the onus is on you and you can prevent this or resolve it with a factory reset. If you rooted your phone, then the only solution may be reinstallation of the OS. 
Unless you are particularly important, don't imagine that your phone was hacked in the same way that Jeff Bezos was or the various press people were because they were considered dissidents by the particular country. The chances of a common person experiencing that kind of hack is close to zero. That's the kind of confidence you can have because of the SE Linux virtual machine and encryption built into every phone. Remember when the FBI wanted Apple to break into the encryption of the phone and Apple wouldn't help them? Today they solved that by allowing AI-based client-side content scanning by Apple. Is this a hack? No. It is intentional spy access built into iOS and macOS, but that is a different subject. Thanks for watching. Now let me tell you about my company and the products we offer. Folks, my company creates products that are intended to protect our privacy. We provide phones that have no centralized control and are invisible to big tech. We have various de Google phones in our store. These devices have no Google on them and no Google ID, so they are invisible to Google. Check out our store for various models. We have a VPN service, Bytes VPN, which is a stealth VPN in that it doesn't scream that you're on a VPN. We do not put thousands of you on a single server. We have Braxmail, which eliminates the metadata from your emails. This means no IP addresses and traces on your email that show where it came from. All these products are on the store on my app, Braxme. Come visit us there. The link is in the description. Again, thank you for watching and see you again soon.